I don't know how many of you have ever been to Niagara Falls, whether on the New York side or Canada side, but it's one of the most beautiful sights in the world. It's an irresistible lure for lovers and honeymooners and daredevils. Um, water from four of the five great lakes containing a fifth of all the fresh water on the planet feeds into the mighty Niagara River and then rushes over the falls at a rate of 60 million gallons a minute, falling at 32 feet a second and hitting the base 176 feet below with a force of 2,500 tons, generating 2.5 million kilowatts of power, enough power to light up 24 million light bulbs at, at one moment. It's beautiful, it's powerful. This is why Niagara Falls is so seductive to daredevils. Less than a handful of people have challenged these mighty rivers and lived to tell about it. I don't know if you remember a couple years ago on June 15, 2012, there were about 130,000 spectators that stood around Niagara Falls and millions and millions of people watched on television as Nick Walenda performed an amazing aerial feat. An 1,800-foot long two-inch steel cable wire was that weighed about seven tons was pulled across the falls by machines. It was stretched rigidly hard and then secured by bolts driven several feet into bedrock. Supporting cables were attached to the main wire to make sure that it didn't sway in the wind. The aerial artist wore the latest high-tech gear and high-tech shoes. The officials of the state of New York required that he wear a harness which secured him safely to the high wire. But with all of these precautions and all of this high-tech equipment, Nick Walenda walked the 1,800-foot cable over Niagara Falls to the delight of the crowd, ABC television, corporate sponsors, and his nervous family. It was a sight to behold, an amazing, and as amazing as that was, he wasn't the first one to do that. On June 30th, 1859, before Nick Valenda was, this was the last time someone tried to attempt to cross the Niagara Falls, and it was a Frenchman by the name of the Great Bolden, Blond, Great Blondin. His aerobic acrobats thrilled audiences across Europe and, and America for years. And at the age of 36, the Great Blondin was about to attempt his greatest feat to cross the Niagara Falls. And instead of crossing it on steel cables, he would walk the 1,300 feet um, on a two-inch thick manila rope. No machine to pull it secure, no supporting cables to hold it steady. Blondin would wear no safety harness, and instead of high-tech gear, this French Frenchman wore Persian slippers. He carried a wooden pole that weighed five times more than Walenda's composite pole. And because of his manila rope, he would actually start and then he would actually go down as he was walking, where by the time he got to the center, he was 50 feet below where he started, and then he would begin a journey upward for the last half of it. Amazingly, as he got halfway through, he took a glass out, and he tied it to a twine and dropped it below, where he picked up some water, pulled it back up, took a sip of the Niagara, dropped the glass, continued his journey the remaining half of the way. He gets all the way to the other half, arrives in sweat, drinks champagne, did a victory dance around with the people that were watching, and then walked back on the rope all the way to the other side. Walenda did his amazing feat once. The great Blondin would actually attempt this feat over and over and over again, each time doing something more electrifying than the previous time. For example, he crossed on his tightrope on a bicycle. He did it on stilts. He did it in the pitch of the night, pitch black of the night. He swung by one arm across. He turned somersaults. He stood on his head on a chair, on a tightrope. Once he pushed a stove in a wheelbarrow and cooked an omelet high over the falls. And he ate it, and then he continued his journey. On another occasion, he crossed blindfolded in a heavy sack. And during his last performance on September 8, 1860, he sat on a table balanced on the tightrope 
eight page grand campaign and then walked across. As amazing as Miss Walenda was, and a lot of you have seen her performance on TV, what Blondin did 152 years earlier was far more electrifying. But history will remember Blondin for his challenge to spectators on June 30th of 1859. On that day, he showed up, and his crowds were there waiting for him to do his next feat. And he, they were cheering him on as he got up. And he turned around to the crowd, and he said, who thinks that I can carry a man on my back as I cross the Niagara Falls? Everyone cheered. Everyone thought he could do it. So then he asked the next question. He said, all right, who wants to climb on my back as I do this? And all of a sudden, there was like pitch silence in the entire area. And no one stepped forward. No one wanted to do it. So Blondin turned to his manager, who has spent years and years promoting him, and said, hey, you, Harry Concord, you get on my back. And see, Concord had been promoting him for years, so he knew he couldn't turn him down because then Blondin would look like a fool, so he had to do it. The agonizing trip took about 40 minutes to cross, and the guy that had pitch black hair when he started had white snowflake hair by the time he was done, hanging on the back of this, uh, on the back of Blondin. The feat was so terrifying to him that his manager ended up in a mental asylum by the time he was done. You know, that's amazing, but what Blondin did there is a metaphor for us in our biblical, in our faith. We have seen God do wonders in our lives. All of us can sit here and testify that God has been good over and over and over again. We read Christ's death-defying feats that he's accomplished. We hear stories or testimonies of people of how God had carried them through to the most petrifying dangers imaginable and we believe that God can do all of those things. Like the spectators that believe that Blondin could do anything on the tightrope, we believe that God can do it. They've seen it with their eyes. But intellectual belief does not equate or qualify as faith. Belief and faith are two different things. The half-brother of Jesus, James, would write in James chapter 2, you believe in God? Great. That's wonderful. But even the demons believe there's a God. So just the fact that you believe in God basically puts you on the same level as a demon. Faith is more than just belief. At Niagara Falls in 1859, faith meant climbing on top of Blondin's back. Faith for us means climbing on the back of Jesus and putting the weight of our lives on his promises. The Sermon on the Mount that we've been studying is so radical because it calls us to put our faith into action, to climb onto the back of the King of Glory and let him carry us to places where we've never been. The Sermon on the Mount is not church as usual religion, nor is it for spectators who are content simply as standing on the sidelines and watching and living vicariously through the faith of other people. It's the call of the old Star Trek, Star Trek mantra to go where no man has gone before. It's the call of Buzz Lightyear to go to infinity and beyond. Um, and today in our text, Jesus talks about one of the most neglected of all spiritual disciplines. For most of us, a relic of bygone ages, he deals with the discipline of fasting and the importance of that for our lives. See, for many postmodern Christians, the thought of fasting is just about as scary as climbing on Blondin's back. But Jesus says in Matthew five verse Matthew six verse eighteen that if you fast the proper way, then your father is going to reward you. He is going to bless you. See, I believe that as a group, as a church, or even as a nation, we're going into a season of history that will test our faith like no other time in our lives. Maybe like walking a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And if we're going to overcome and stand firm in the days ahead. We will need every weapon that's at our disposal. And so the weapon this morning is the weapon of fasting. We'll need to recover the weapon of fasting. And here's 
what I hope that you will hear by the time that I'm done. Here's what I'm hoping you will get by the time we're done our text. I hope you will hear and understand that our greatest victories in life are often won on our knees and with empty stomachs. The greatest victories that we will ever have is not the things that we do. It's when we fall on our knees before God. That's where our greatest victories will ever be won. See, the Bible is full of scripture on fasting. There are over 80 references to the idea of fasting in the Old and the New Testament. You can, you go through, you can't imagine how many heroes of our faith prepared for battle by fasting. When there was a national calamity in the Old Testament, the Israelites responded with fasting and praying. When King David was pleading for the life of his baby, he did so with fasting. When the prophets would call people to repentance, he would call them to fast and pray. Before Jesus battled Satan in the wilderness, he spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying. When the Jerusalem church was faced with persecution and trial, they gathered together and fasted and prayed. When the church in Antioch was trying to decide who would be the first Christian missionaries to go into the world, they fasted and prayed before laying their hands on Paul and Silas. Before Timothy was ordained to be a leader in the church, the elders would fast and pray before they would pray over him. Even the Apostle Paul would write in Corinthians about husbands and wives going through seasons of fasting and praying and intimacy with God. Listen, guys, fasting is a predominant theme in the Old Testament that flows all the way to the New Testament and is still relevant for us today. The early church fathers would talk about the, they couldn't imagine how faith could be separated from fasting. St. Gregory, one of the early church fathers, said, it's impossible to engage in spiritual battle without the subjugation of the appetites. Martin Luther believed that demons trembled in the presence of believers that fasted. Jonathan Edwards, who God used to spark one of the greatest revivals our nation's seen, preached a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And before he preached that, he spent weeks and weeks in fasting. And the result was that our nation went into a great revival unlike ever seen before. Fasting is vital. When America faced a bloody civil war, President Lincoln called the nation to fast and pray. A long line of spiritual giants that have gone before us would agree with today's principle that our greatest victories are not won by what we do, but our greatest victories are won when we fall on our knees before God and give up everything else and say, God, move. God, work. God, show up. See, if you're struggling this morning with discouragement or defeat or despair or doubt, I'm hoping that I, by the time we're done, your interest is piqued in the idea of putting everything else to the side and being intimate and alone with God because there is great victory that happens there. If you're here this morning and you're wondering, God, where are you? What you're doing? Maybe this is a season where God's calling you to say, I need to stop doing all this stuff and just spend some time with him, be intimate with him. I want to give you three things, three main things that Jesus teaches about this idea of fasting from our text. The first thing is that fasting is an expectation. It's not an option. Fasting is an expectation. It's not an option. Jesus begins in Matthew 6, verse 16. He says, when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast. He expects that as followers, we will fast. The original Greek word for fast is a combination of two words, which basically puts the word not and eat together, not eat. But listen, fasting doesn't necessarily mean just abstaining from foods only. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul speaks about a fast from sex or sexual intimacy when married couple would forego intimacy with each other to engage with intimacy with God through seasons of intense prayer. In a sense, the Sabbath, the day of rest, is a fast. We're fasting from our busyness of six days and resting and saying, God, I just want to be with you today. Can I suggest to you that it wouldn't do us harm, it wouldn't hurt us as a group, and all of us would benefit if we took a fast from media once in a while. Maybe turning off the television for a day. Maybe turning off our mobile devices or maybe saying I'm not going to be on social media the six hours I spend every day on it. And instead of that time, go into quiet meditation and prayer and be intimate with God. 
This may come as a shock to you, but fasting is mentioned more than any other doctrine in Scripture. Fasting is mentioned more than the idea of baptism. Most of us in this room would agree that if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be baptized, but many of us have never fasted. In his book, Hungry for God, Hunger for God, Desiring God Through Fasting, John Piper makes this challenge. He says, do you have a hunger for God? If we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because we drank so deeply of God and were satisfied, but it's because we've nibbled so long at the things of this world. Our soul is stuffed with small things, with worldly things, and there's no room for God there. See, if we're full of what the world offers, then perhaps a feast at fast might express or maybe even increase our soul's appetite for God. Between the dangers of self-denial and self-indulgence is a pleasant path called fasting. Maybe we've filled ourselves up with so much of this world and we're satisfied with what the world offers that that's why we don't hunger for God. Fasting is not an option for us as followers of Jesus. It's a requirement. It's an expectation. He expects us to be intimate with him, to say, God, you are more valuable to me than food and social media and whatever else is in there, like priority to me. I want to put it to the side because I want to be intimate with you. Secondly, fasting holds great rewards. There are incredible rewards to fasting. Look at what Jesus says in verses 16 and 17 of our text. He says, but when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it's not going to be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Listen, I've fasted often in my life. I've seen God move active seasons of fasting, but the power of it still remains a mystery to me. I can't tell you all of the rewards or the reasons for fasting or exactly what it does for us, but I know this. Jesus says that our Father is going to reward us when we fast. Look at Scripture. When people fast, amazing things happen. Giant things happen. Kingdoms fall. Plagues are stopped. Demons are cast out. Riddles are solved. Revival is sparked. Superhuman strength is unleashed. When prayer is accompanied by fasting, its effectiveness takes on exponential power. Don't ask me to explain why or how. Just believe me when I say it happens. Or better yet, believe Jesus when he says, when you fast, God will reward you. Let me give you a few possibilities of the rewards of fasting. Number one, fasting is peaceful. This is a strange statement, but it's so true. Do you remember Jesus went 40 days without eating, and he was in the wilderness? 40 days is probably the limit of what a human being can fast. When you fast for a long, long period of time, there comes a moment where all your hunger pains leave. You actually are content without eating. It's the most pleasant part of the fast. Your stomach no longer aches. You can focus. Your head is no longer dizzy. Your energy returns. Your thoughts are razor sharp. And your senses are more acute than any other time in history. But when fasting, that is when fasting pays a huge dividend. But there comes a time, usually about after 30 days or so, when the hunger pangs start to come back again. Your body is telling you to end the fast. People around you are telling you to end the fast. And now you're beginning to starve to death. The Bible says that when Jesus was fasting, about a set, after a certain amount of time, he began to get hungry. And at that moment, Satan comes and begins to tempt him and says, you're God. Why don't you turn these stones into bread and eat? And Jesus makes a statement about the heart of fasting. He says, listen, he, he goes, man cannot live by bread alone. That's not the only way, that, that's not the only thing that sustains us but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In short, Jesus says, food is not what sustains me. God sustains me. It is God that gives me strength to live my life. Listen, until we understand that, you will live a defeated life. Until you grasp that, you'll walk discouraged. But when you grasp 
and understand that, it will radically change everything. To understand fasting, you've got to understand why we eat. Why do we eat? I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think we eat. Number one, we eat to live, don't we? I mean, we need at least 1,200 calories a day to live a healthy life. Number two, we live to get stronger. Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps requires 12,000 calories a day when he's in training. During the rigorous Tour de France, bicyclists consume eight to 9,000 calories a day, carefully calculated to include highly nutritious foods that give long-term endurance and snacks that give them short bursts of energy. For those of us whose chief exercise is to ride the sofa in front of the television, we don't need that much calories, right? Um, but we need to eat to get stronger. Number three, we eat for pleasure. There are few pleasures more enjoyable than eating. Unfortunately, most of what we eat is guilty pleasure. I can relate to President Bush when he said, I hate broccoli. I hated it when my mother fed it to me, and now that I'm the president of the United States, I don't have to eat it anymore. I can relate. I think fruit is a lot better than vegetables. At least when fruit rots, you can turn it into wine, which you can't do with Brussels sprouts or broccoli, right? Number four, we eat broccoli. We eat broccoli. <laughs> we eat to make ourselves feel better. You ever get depressed and go grab food? You ever go through a bad day and you end up indulging in like a cake or ice cream? We call it comfort food, right? We get depressed. We want to gulp down a quart of haagen ice cream. For some of us, food becomes an obsession. Can I say sadly, for some of us, food is a drug. If you don't believe me, for some of us, food is, it is an obsession. If you don't believe me, after service today, go back to your own Facebook page. Go back to your own Instagram page. Forget others. Just go to yours. See how many pictures you have taken of food that you are about to consume. Just to show the world what you're about to eat and, in a sense, to show them how good you're eating, but really, in an essence, to make them jealous of what you're about to eat, right? I mean, that's really why you're posting it, just to make someone jealous that, look at this steak I'm about to eat, and the rest of us sit there and be like, dude, what are we doing? We're sitting here eating Burger King, and you're eating like a steak. Um, see, St. Paul would say that, talk about people whose God is their stomach. If that's the reason why we eat, it's to live, to get stronger, for pleasure, and to make us feel, ourselves feel better, can I suggest to you that we need to fast for the exact same reason? We need to spend time with God so that we can live, so that we can live spiritually. We need to feed on him and his word so that we can grow stronger for the things that he's called us to do. We need to find pleasure in God. He's the only one that can make us feel better when we're down in the dumps. Elizabeth Elliot said that fasting is a wonderful way to indulge ourselves in God. One finds what an astonishing amount of time is spent in planning, purchasing, preparing, eating, and cleaning up after meals when you fast. You know, when I've spent times in fasting, I've been reminded a lot how often I turn to the garbage cans of creation rather than coming to the Creator to feast on Heaven's pleasure. Fasting is feasting. We might not think of it like that, but we are enjoying God. It is feasting on what God wants for our lives. Number two, fasting brings focus. The prophet Daniel was in a hard place in the Old Testament and needed some supernatural wisdom. He writes that I set my face before God to seek God in prayer with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Almost every time you see fasting in Scripture, it's a time of intense need. We know this from nature. When an animal is wounded or sick, it goes off into isolation to a dark, quiet place. It lies down and refuses to eat, and you know something's wrong. Animals innately know that the digestive system saps their energy and resources from the rest of the body. But a fast shuts down the digestive system so they can 
the energy can be used for places for which wounded so that healing can happen faster. Can I suggest to you the same is true in the spiritual realm. There are so many things in our lives that distract us and zap our energy and our focus. When we need wisdom or healing or transformation that can only come by beholding God's glory, then we need to stop eating. We need to turn off social media. We need to get away from the distractions that zap our energy and our focus. That's why so many of God's greatest warriors spent time alone in the desert with God. That's why Jesus would often go away from his disciples and be alone and intimate with God. In Korea, almost every pastor has a place called a prayer mountain where he goes to pray at least one or two times a week to fast and pray. Often, Korean pastors will go to these prayer mountains for weeks at a time. And you've got to ask, how can you do all the work of the church while away on the prayer mountain? Can I suggest to you that the reason, that the fact that they pray is why the Korean church is so powerful today? I remember my first missions trip to India about 15 years ago when we were going as a group of college students and the pastor said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a fasting prayer. And I was like, really? I just came, traveled 17 hours and you want me to not eat right now? And I'm, and I'm Indian. I wanted Indian food at that time, right? And so I'm like, you're telling me not to eat? And so, and I'm thinking, I, I mean, I grew up in a church where we did fasting prayer, maybe like 1% of the church showed up. Um, so I'm thinking maybe there's going to be two or three people and we're going to fast and pray and that's about it. We get there. It's an open tent. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people who give up food for a day to fast and pray that God would move in their nation. The result, the following week, this pastor does an open air crusade in a major city. There's 30,000 people that are there. Thousands respond when he invites them to give their lives to Jesus. Prayers are powerful. But when he fasted and prayed, the pastor and the people were saying, God, it is not with our might or our strength that we are going to accomplish this. You have to work. You have to show up. See, there's a big difference between doing the work of the church and seeing God work through the church. Huge difference. We can spend all of our time, all of our energy, all of our resources trying to make a difference in this city. It's in vain if God is not at work. No life is going to be changed if God does not soften the hearts of people. When we fast, when we pray, we are saying, God, we can do this. We can plan, we can work, but unless you show up, nothing's going to happen. When we fast and pray for our families, we're saying, God, I might have the skills to provide financially and know how to balance a budget and do all this stuff, but unless you show up, I have no wisdom, no ability to raise my kids for college. I can't change their hearts. I can't change their lives. We're saying, God, my dependence is on you. Why, well, students, when you pause and you fast, you're saying, God, I can study and get good grades, but if you don't show up, it's not my ability or skills or talents that's going to put me at this place of employment or place me where you want me to be. It is you opening those doors for me. My dependence, my life, my trust is on you. Number three, fasting forges faith. Back to the story at Niagara Falls, those spectators that are standing there, they believe that Blondin could carry someone across. They knew he could do it. They trusted that he could do it. They believed it, but they didn't have faith that they would be the one. People of faith will get up on his back and go across the falls. You know, faith isn't easy, is it? Sometimes faith makes us do things we're uncomfortable doing. The guy who actually ended up on his back ends up in a mental asylum. People say, I don't think I can fast. It will be dangerous to my health, and I don't know what will happen to me. And it may be if you have certain medical conditions, but for most of us, can I suggest to you that fasting is an opportunity for us to trust God? That's what it is. It is basically saying, God, I trust you. It is a great faith adventure. Just like staying up and praying all night, just like going to someone who doesn't know Jesus and saying, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? Just like refusing to work on the Sabbath, even though you're up against deadlines, 
just like walking away from a pet sin because you know it doesn't honor Jesus, just like doing the right thing even though it might cost you everything. It's good to stretch yourself by doing things that are beyond you, climbing on Christ's back and letting him carry you over the tightrope, over roaring trails. Why do you want to forge great faith? The writer of Hebrews will say it like this. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. As much as we want to be successful and wealthy and comfortable, is there a greater reward than we can ever get than God saying to us, well done, my good and faithful servant? Is there anything more rewarding than seeing the God who created us, who loved us, who died for us, saying, well done? And I suggest to you there is nothing more rewarding. Yeah, but there's a danger, and this is the third main point. It's don't lose the rewards of fasting. Verse 10, Jesus reminds us of his least favorite people on the earth. He He says in verse 16, he says, When you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others, but they've already got their rewards. Remember, we talked about who the hypocrites were a couple weeks ago. The original Greek word for the hypocrite comes from Greek theater. The hypocrites were actors who wore masks. They play a role. They are posers. For them, life is a stage. Their payoff is the applause that they get from other people. And Jesus has already exposed their game in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about how they give to the poor when they blow their own horns or how they pray in the synagogue so that they can get the attention of other people and how they fast, how they leave their hair unkempt or their breath is bad and their faces are gloomy. They wear their piety as a badge for our honor for others to see. And Jesus says that they've played for the applause of other people and that's the only reward that they're ever going to get. And he says in verse 17, he says, when you fast, go wash your face, anoint your head, that your fasting is not seen by others, but is seen by your Father who sees what you do in secret and rewards you. They're telltale signs of fasting. Your breath will stink. So he says, use mouthwash. You'll be fatigued. Spruce spruce yourself up. Put a spring in your step. Keep it to yourself as much as possible. This is the same as giving in private, um, praying in private. Sometimes giving is public. Sometimes praying is public. But it's a call. Sometimes it's a call for the entire church to fast and pray. But Jesus wants us to know that don't let pride creep in. Don't do it for the applause of other people. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be on guard specifically. You've got to be watchful of three things. You've got to be careful that you're not trying to impress others. Be careful that you're not trying to impress others. The rewards are slim pickings. You know, most people are not going to be impressed that you fast. Even Christians will talk you out of fasting, right? I mean, Imagine all of us going out to eat after church and we invite you and you're fasting and you're like the odd one out. And we'll say, oh, come hang out with us. And you hang out with us and pretty soon you're nibbling on a fly and then you don't realize what you're doing and somehow we seduce you to give up your fast. Even believers don't want you to fast. You'll have dicey moments when you have to come up with fancy excuses for not eating when you're out with the group. So keep it to yourself. Let your father who is unseen reward you with all the delights that you discussed earlier. Secondly, beware of trying to impress yourself. Don't try to impress others, but also be careful that you're not trying to impress yourself. Remember, the hypocrite is self-starving. All he wants is applause for himself. He wants to affirm himself, and he wants others to affirm him, whether she is applauded by others or by herself. There are a lot of self-serving reasons to fast. There was one pastor that joked that Catholics fast to do penance while Protestants fast to lose weight, right? To use fasting as a penance is a denial of the cross. Jesus paid all of our penalties when he died for us. You don't fast to get forgiven. You have already been forgiven. Nothing we could ever do will purchase redemption for us. In the words of the old hymn, nothing in my hands I bring. 
simply to the cross I clung. But guys, fasting is not a means to lose weight either. Fasting is probably the worst way to lose weight. You'll get no reward doing that. Fasting shuts down your metabolism. And after you begin to eat again, the weight will pile on much faster than before you started fasting. Fasting is not about you looking better in the mirror or fitting in the clothes that you used to wear 10 years ago or feeling good about your newfound self-discipline. Fasting is not anything more or anything less than putting down the fork and getting face-to-face with God and saying, God, I want to be with you in your love. That's it. To make it about yourself is to miss the point and to lose the reward. Finally, beware of trying to impress God. Fasting isn't a way that you impress or earn God's approval. Remember the words of Ephesians 3 where Paul writes, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. If you never fast, God will not love you less. He will love you the same. If you fast like a desert hermit, God will not love you more. His love for you is the same regardless. But I would say that through fasting, you will fall in love with God more. The results or the benefits are for you where you see God in a new light. His love for you doesn't increase. But the more you spend time with him, your love for him will increase. Faith, oh, it's back there. Fasting is not a way to manipulate God to do something for you. You don't fast to twist God's arm to perform on your behalf. That is not why you fast. That's about as silly and as stupid as a televangelist that tells you that you can get more from heaven if you sow a seed and give money to his ministry. Edwin Cole, who was a prominent speaker among men's groups, used to say, A fast is not a hunger strike. Fasting submits to God's commands. A hunger strike tries to make God submit to our demands. See, whatever God does for us, he does that because of his grace in our lives and because he delights to do it. Verse 18 reminds us that he is our father. He doesn't say you're God in heaven. He says you're father in heaven. I've got three kids. I will do my best to provide and take care of them to the best of my capability. If I go that out for my kids, imagine what your heavenly father will do for you because he loves you, because he delights in rewarding you with good things. If you use any spiritual discipline as a bargaining chip, it's dangerous. It will hurt you, but it will destroy you. And it will demean the very good nature and the goodness of our Father. Guys, Jesus commends fasting. He fasted often himself. He is our model. He is who we are called to be like. Let me encourage you that we become a people who fast. And I'm not saying we're going to call corporate fast because we don't know if God will let us do that. Let me invite you in secret. Find time where you say, you know what, God? I'm putting away social media. I'm putting away food. I'm putting away hanging out or playing video games or going to the gym or whatnot. I just want to be with you. Whether that's for a day or half a day or a week, I want to get closer to you. Can you imagine if we are people who are fasting, seeking God's face, desiring God, not my will but your will, I'm willing to give up the things that I find pleasure in because I want you to move and work. If we were a people that did that, the impact that God would make through our lives and our cities. So let me invite you. Find time. Find ways where you can go in secret and say, you know what? I'm going to put this food to the side. I'm just going to spend some time with God. I'm going to grab my word. I'm going to read the word. I'm just going to ask God to speak to me, and I'm just going to seek God's face. See, I know for some of you that's like climbing on top Londin's back and going across Niagara Falls, no, not knowing if you're going to make it. Listen, you're not going on Blondin's back. 
You're going on the back of the one who paid the price for your life. Everything that you need in life has already been accomplished. He has already gained the victory. He has already been victorious. He is your father. He is your brother. He has promised that there is nothing that is formed against you that's going to prosper. He will take care of you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. He will watch over you. And the table that we're about to celebrate is the greatest example that he is dependable. That we can count on him with our lives. That we can trust him with every aspect of our lives. So we celebrate the table not because it's a cool thing to do. We celebrate the table because every week when we do it, it reminds us that we have a loving God who never leaves us, who never forsakes us, who paid the ultimate price for us so that we could put our trust and confidence in him knowing that he will not fail us. So this morning I want to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. See if there's anything in your life that's not from God. Maybe this morning God is convicting you of things that are idols. Things that you value so much that you can't put down. Maybe it's food. Maybe God is saying you eat way too much. Listen to him. Maybe God is saying you are on the internet way too much. Maybe God is saying that you hang out with your friends way too much. Maybe God is saying that you work way too much. What is the Holy Spirit convicting you of this morning? Would you let him work in your heart? And then when you spend some time with him and meditate, whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come and grab the elements from the table and then go back to your seats. And when after the worship team is done singing, we'll come and we'll partake of the table together. Let's worship. Let's pray.